Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Gene Eric Salker, and today I'm going to be talking about um, Disaster on the Mississippi, the, the book I wrote about the Sultana disaster, uh, more specifically about the disaster itself. Um, the Sultana was a Mississippi steamboat, sidewheel Mississippi steamboat, built in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio in 1863. Uh, and it was originally built for the cotton trade, even though the Mississippi River was um, still not open when it was built in uh, January of 63. Uh, but the, the uh, builder and owner, uh, Preston Lodwick, knew that eventually the Mississippi was going to open. And so when he built his vessel, he built it with extra wide uh, decking uh, on, on the outside of the second deck there. You can see it in this sort of drawing. Um, and that was where uh, cotton bales could be stacked. He figured eventually uh, Grant was already making some moves towards Vicksburg. Eventually Vicksburg and Port Hudson are gonna be captured. The Mississippi will open up. And then uh, the Sultana will be able to run uh, down to New Orleans and back up to St. Louis or the Ohio River, wherever, carrying cotton bales and make a lot of money for him. So. Uh, one of the things that he had done, Preston Lodwick had done, was he had extra tall smokestacks built onto the Sultana. And this was because he didn't want a spark to come out of the smokestacks and land on these cotton bales and start a fire. Now, on the very first uh, trip of the Sultana, its maiden voyage, it was built in Cincinnati and it went upriver towards Pittsburgh. But at Wheeling, West Virginia, it couldn't get under the, uh, uh, the railroad bridge at Wheeling, West Virginia because of the small smoke, uh, small smokestacks. So they ended up offloading whatever freight they had at Wheeling, taking on whatever freight they could at Wheeling and heading back down river to Cincinnati. They did this for a couple months, just working the kinks out and eventually the, the uh, Sultana will drop down river to uh, Memphis. And then it is uh, just basically stays on the Mississippi running between uh, St. Louis and uh, New Orleans. Once Vicksburg is open and the river is, is open, Preston Lodwick uh, ran his, his Sultana up and down the river for about a year. And then in, in uh, middle of 1864, he decides that he's made enough money, he wants a newer boat, and he sells it to a conglomerate of uh, captain or uh, uh, businessmen in St. Louis. One of them was Captain James Cass Mason, a 34 uh, year old individual who really had a reputation uh, like today, I guess we would call it somebody with a lead foot. He liked to race his boats. In fact, prior to buying into the Sultana, he had taken and he had raced against the Sultana and he had beaten it. But he probably saw that with a with the right captain and the right uh, you know a crew on board, uh, he could probably get the Sultana to be a, 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 a winner the next time that it was in a race. So he will buy into the Sultana. And he actually buys a three eighths share. Well, what happened was with so many steamboats operating on the Mississippi after Vicksburg Falls, uh, the, 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 uh, there was so much of a glut that no steamboat was making a lot of money. Uh, and James Cass Mason had gotten into a couple little accidents probably because he was racing the Sultana there was some damage to the hull that had to be repaired. There was some damage to the paddle wheels when they were going uh, up river one time against an ice flow. And he was losing money rather than making money. Uh, and so he will sell half of his uh, 3 8 share. He becomes a 3 16 owner then to his clerk. And then eventually he will even take and sell half of that uh, to another person. So he becomes a minority owner in the Sultana. He's hurting for money by the time of 1865. Now, in April of 1865, the Sultana is sitting at Cairo, Illinois, having come downriver from uh, St. Louis. And word comes on the, on the early morning of April 15th that President Abraham Lincoln has been assassinated in Washington, D.C. They also said that Secretary of State Seward had been assassinated, which was wrong, but they didn't know that. So James Cass Mason says, this is my opportunity to make a name for the Sultana. He will grab a number of uh, Cairo newspapers and head down river because there was no telegraphic communication with the South. All the uh, telegraph, 
wires had been cut down uh, during the war, either by either side. And the only way that news traveled down river was basically by a steamboat. So he grabs these newspapers and he sets off. He will take and he will uh, put black bunting along the sides of the Sultana. And as he goes down river, he's telling, dropping here and there and telling everybody about the assassina assassination of Abraham Lincoln and Secretary of War Stewart or Seward. Uh, he gets all the way down to Vicksburg. And as they pull into the uh, port at Vicksburg there, uh, a unscrupulous individual, uh, Captain Reuben Benton Hatch from Illinois, and I'm from Illinois, so I hate to admit this, but Reuben Benton Hatch jumps on board the Sultana. And of course, he's interested in the death of Lincoln, but he's more interested in cutting a deal with James Cass Mason. Reuben Hatch had been uh, a, a quartermaster in the, in the army since 1861, and he had been arrested a couple of times for some unscrupulous deals, but he was a personal friend of Abraham Lincoln and his brother was the secretary of state of Illinois. And every time that Reuben Benton Hatch got arrested and possibly put, put up for court martial, he would call upon Abraham Lincoln, he would call upon his influential friends and he would get off scot-free. So he is now the quartermaster in charge of Vicksburg and he approaches Mason knowing that Mason is hurting for money. Also, Reuben Benton Hatch, uh, prior to the war and even during the war, had owned a, a general store uh, in uh, uh, Western Illinois. And he takes and his store had burnt down. So he's hurting for money. So he contacts Mason, comes on board the boat, and he says, I have a deal for you, basically. He says, outside of Vicksburg, there uh, is a parole camp set up. and uh, about four miles outside of Vicksburg, the uh, Confederacy has decided that Andersonville prison is, is, the war is almost over. All these prisoners at Andersonville, we don't know what to do with them. We're going to send them to a parole camp outside of Vicksburg. At the same time, from Cahaba prison in Alabama, near Selma, Alabama, those prisoners are being sent towards Vicksburg. So you have outside, four miles outside of Vicksburg, about four or 5,000 ex-prisoners uh, of war, Union soldiers waiting to be sent back north. Uh, the, the cartel that is set up outside of Vicksburg is that they, these prisoners will still be under the uh, control of the Confederacy, but they will now be clothed, fed, taken care of, uh, given hospital stays or whatever, medicine by the Union Army. What they're waiting for is for Southern prisoners up in the North to be sent down for a one-to-one -one, man to man exchange, a private for a private, a lieutenant for a lieutenant and so forth. Um, but what happens is there's nobody coming from the North. So the, this, this becomes a bottleneck down there in Vicksburg. These guys are just piling up and piling up and piling up. And eventually, uh, uh, Captain Hatch realized that these guys are eventually going to be sent home. And when they do, the government is actually paying about $8 per officer and $2.75 per enlisted man to send them up north. If he can guarantee James Cass Mason a lot of 1,000 men, roughly about, say, $3,000, would James Cass Mason cut, give him a kickback? Hatch says, I'll guarantee you, you these 1,000 men if you guarantee to give me some of the money that you will be getting. Well, Mason is more than happy to, say, keep 2,500 and give 500 to Hatch, so he agrees on it. Now, he's still going downriver um, reporting the death of Lincoln. He's got to go all the way to New Orleans and then turn around and come back up river. So this fellow here is Reuben Benton Hatch. We had no photographs of Hatch until just recently when he was identified in this photograph. Now, these are uh, the prisoners from Andersonville and Cahaba. This is what a typical prisoner looked like coming out of Andersonville. This is Eponidas W. McIntosh, 14th Illinois Infantry. He will actually leave Vicksburg on a different steamboat, but he is left behind at Memphis and he climbs aboard the Sultana once the Sultana docks at Memphis figuring, well, I'll get a ride up to Cairo, Illinois, 
uh, the Sultana's uh, final destination. And of course he ends up in the disaster. Now, the second uh, prison camp was Cahaba. The guys at Cahaba uh, were treated a little better than those at, at, or I should say a lot better than the guys at Andersonville. This is a typical uh, picture of a, of a before and after. John Henry King had been with the 9th Indiana Cavalry and you see him on the left side of the screen. He's very robust. His cheeks are full, his chest is full. And on the other side, it's a picture taken immediately after he was released from uh, Cahaba and came to Vicksburg. So you got a perfect before and after. You see how the clothes is not fitting on him anymore. His cheeks are all shallow. Um, his chest is, is sort of you know emaciated and such. They were not in as bad a condition as the fellows that came from Andersonville, but they had still suffered. So for about a month or so, these guys are gonna sit outside of this, in this parole camp called Camp Fisk and just really doing nothing but eating, resting, putting a little bit of weight on. Well, the Sultana will go down river, leave. And in the meantime, word does come for uh, the guys to be uh, released. The first steamboat to take some guys up river uh, is going to be the Henry Ames. They will take 1,315 men from the states of Iowa, uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And this was the boat that Eponidas McIntosh will get on with his il fellow Illinois people. The second uh, boat to come along uh, and get some men was the Olive Branch. And they will take 916 men from the Eastern states, New York, uh, Maryland, uh, the, you know, the, the upper uh, uh, New England states. The, only, the reason that it only got 900 uh, or 619 men instead of 1,000, the commanding general, General uh, Napoleon Jackson Tecumseh Dana, would have liked to have sent in lots of about 1,000 men up to the north. But the reason there's only 619 placed on the olive branch is because the books that the Union officers in Vicksburg have gotten from the Confederate prisons are so jumbled up. People were not put in those books in any numerical order or alphabetical order. It was just whenever captives came into the prison, their names were entered. So you don't have them by state, you don't have them by alphabet. And what the uh, Union officers in Vicksburg are trying to do is they are trying to unjamble or unjumble these books. Uh, and it's taken a lot of time. So there was only 619 names available by the time the olive branch shows up. Now the Sultana will travel all the way down river to Vicksburg, take up some uh, paying civilian passengers and start up river. When they were about four hours short of Vicksburg, they actually sprang a leak in one of the, one of the boilers. And the uh, chief engineer will take and reduce the pressure in the boilers and sort of limp, limp into Vicksburg. This is what the boilers would have looked like on the Sultana. And what has happened is, uh, you where, where you see in this picture on the right, the fellow standing there, that is where the firemen would throw the coals onto a grating, which is right underneath that, uh, or right above the little white spot on the boiler. The coals would heat up and it will uh, cause a, the hot air to actually go from the right-hand side underneath the boiler all the way to the left-hand side. And then it goes through those tubes. You see those orange tubes there and then up and out the chimney. And that is uh, just basically drawn there by, by a draft, similar to the chimney in your house. And as this hot air passes through those tubes, you see the blue, that's the water inside the boiler. The water will start to boil and the steam goes into that pink thing on the top called the steam drum. The steam will then travel through those pipes leading off to the left. And that leads to the engines and gets the engines uh, going. So what happens on the Sultana is they spring a leak in the forward part of the uh, middle uh, right-hand boiler. And uh, uh, Nathan Wintringer, the first engineer, will, as I said, reduce the pressure and they sort of limp into Vicksburg. While he runs off to get a boiler mechanic, Captain Mason rushes into town to try to get uh, the promised 1,000 men that he is supposed to get. Now. During the, the day of uh, April 26, as the men are being placed aboard the Sultana, a second steamboat shows up, a larger steamboat called the Lady Gay. And they wanna take some of these men also. 
So there's another sort of uh, bribe taking place with, with uh, Captain Hatch, but he has cut this deal with Mason and he's basically guarantees that Mason will get all the men that are out at Camp, uh, camp Fist or the parole camp. Um, the officer in charge of this, George Williams, and Captain George Williams and Captain Frederick Speed in charge of placing these guys on trains at the parole camp and sending them into Vicksburg to be placed on the Sultana, believe there's only about 1,400 men to go on board the Sultana. Not a lot, considering the Henry Ames just took 1,300. So the Lady Gay will leave Vicksburg without a single uh, Union ex-prisoner on board. And all through the day, the Sultana is being loaded. There are three actual train loads of men that come from Vicksburg or from the parole camp into Vicksburg to be placed aboard the Sultana. And the Sultana is getting more and more and more crowded. Actually, in this drawing here, this painting here, which is actually in Vicksburg on a uh, the flood wall, they have a flood wall uh, protecting the city from the rising Mississippi River even today. Uh, this This mural is painted on the side of the wall and you see in the distance there, the Lady Gay steaming away. At one point, while the Lady Gay was still there and the Sultana was getting more and more crowded, what happens is the men said, we're not gonna go on the Sultana anymore. It's way too crowded. You're crowding us on like a bunch of hogs. We're gonna go on the Lady Gay until one of the union officers in charge of the loading says, you don't wanna go on the Lady Gay. It's got smallpox on board. Well, these guys, because of their weakened condition, from being in prison, even though they've had about a month of sitting around doing nothing and gaining a little bit of weight, figured that, well, smallpox in my weakened condition will kill me. So let's go on board the Sultana. We've been crowded in prison. We've been crowded, you know, on trains. We can be crowded for two or three more days going up river to Cairo, Illinois. So they, they all get on board. One of the guys that, uh, uh, is in charge of the Union prisoners is William H. Fiddler of the 6th Kentucky Cavalry, the major. He was the ranking officer, and he is one of the guys that complains that the boat is being way too overcrowded. But Captain Mason says, well, I can't do anything about it. Union authorities have taken control. They're going to put on as many as, as they can. Mason does, however, notice that they're putting on a lot more than a thousand. And he does complain at one point, but as he stated, it's basically taken out of his hand and uh, as many as they can put on board, that's what they're gonna put on board. Now, this slide is specifically left black because I wanted to show you exactly what was on board the Sultana. The Sultana at Vicksburg will take on 300,000 pounds of sugar, which are, are in these huge barrels called hogsheads that are placed in the hold. That's good, it acts as a ballast because on the upper decks, you're gonna have almost a hundred government horses and mules. They're crowded around the back part of the decks. You're also gonna have 70 paying civilian passengers. Imagine being a civilian passenger with all these men suddenly being crowded on board the Sultana. You have a crew of 85 men and women, and you had placed on board uh, 22 guards from the 58th Ohio Infantry to make sure these guys did not cause problems and get into fist fights and things. But there was 1,959 recently released Union prisoners of war placed on board the Sultana. Not 1,000, not 1,400, but almost 2,000. So all total, there was 2,136 people placed on a boat that is legally registered to carry only 376 people plus a crew of 85. And don't let me forget, there was also one pet alligator kept in a sturdy wooden crate on the main deck. Um, the soldiers had never been this close to a live alligator before. They didn't have the zoos like we have now. So they thought it was fun to poke sticks at it and watch the alligator chomp and, and hiss and stuff. So the crew felt sorry for it. It was their pet. And they take this alligator in a big sturdy wooden crate and they drag it into a, um, uh, a closet underneath the main staircase. And we will hear more about the alligator in due time. Now the Sultana will start up river on the, on the night of April uh, 24th, 1865. And it is actually going up against one of the strongest floods in, in recent Mississippi history. 
uh, at points, the, the river is actually three miles wide. The reason that it was so bad was because we had had a lot of snows uh, in the northern uh, states in uh, late 1864, early 1865. All of that is starting to melt and go into the, the big rivers, which then flow into the Mississippi. Also, the levees and the dikes along the Mississippi have, have basically been torn to pieces. They've just, they've just you know, been, been neglected because the Army Corps of Engineers, which maintains those dikes and levees, has been doing other things during the war. They've been building forts for the Union. They've been corduroying roads. They've been doing all kinds of things, and they've been neglecting the dikes and levees along the Mississippi River. So as the, Mississippi, as the Sultanic starts up river, it's really going uh, against a strong flood current. Uh, the, the pilot will say that they maintain a nine or 10 mile per hour uh, uh, speed, which is okay if you're against a regular current, but if you're going up against a strong current, that meant that you really had to have some pressure in those boilers in order to keep at that normal speed. Now, the Sultana will stop at Helena, Arkansas on the morning of April 26, 1865, and an enterprising photographer, Thomas W. Banks, will see a picture that he is just totally amazed at. He, he has never seen a boat as crowded as a Sultana, and he will turn his camera and take a picture of this. What was Banks doing there with his camera? Well, he was taking pictures of Helena, Arkansas. This is one of the pictures he will take. Helena was inundated by that flood. And at spots, you could see where Union troops in Helena had to move about the city streets on boats. And here, here you can see they're moving an artillery piece or, or a caisson through the streets of the flooded Mississippi, uh, uh, Helena. Now, the, now, this is a famous photograph of the Sultana. And I have looked at this many, many, many times over the 30, 35 years I've studied Sultana. And there are a lot of little things you can see. One of the things you see here is where this circle is showing is a head of one of the horses. The horses were kept on that back deck. And this is, you, you, uh, Thomas W. Banks captured one of the horse's heads in this picture. You can see here where this circle is, this is laundry hanging on a line. The white in the middle there, sort of on an angle, is laundry that uh, the, the uh, soldiers have placed to dry out. Up here in the middle of the smokestacks is a pair of elk's antlers. On the trip just prior to this, the Sultana had, had set a record by being the fastest boat to go from New Orleans up to St. Louis. And because of that, they were awarded the coveted elk's antlers. Elk's antlers signified that this was a fast boat. If you had five, six, seven boats uh, at a dock and you're a, uh, a businessman and you wanna send your freight as quick as possible, you can look at all these boats and the one that has the elk's antlers in between the, the smokestacks, that's gonna be the fastest boat. That's the one you wanna put your freight on. So Captain Mason had earned this the right. Again, he was a lead foot. He liked to race his boat. He probably cut across fields and everything because of the flood and had gotten to, to uh, from New Orleans to St. Louis the quickest uh, trip possible for uh, April of 1865, and he was awarded these. Notice this one guy here uh, where the circle is. He's actually standing up a little higher, and that's because he's standing on the overturned single lifeboat that the Sultana had. It actually had a metallic lifeboat that was turned upside down on the, on the upper deck so that it didn't fill with water, and he is uh, undoubtedly standing on top of it. At the very back of the Sultana, where this larger circle is, there's also a little boat. This is not a rowboat. This is called the Sounding Yawl, Y-A-W-L. Uh, this boat is used in case of low water. You put this boat in front of you and you have a couple of guys uh, paddle it and they'll drop a leaded line into the water to see how, how deep the water is. So you don't want to bottom out. Uh, during the disaster, five deckhands will, uh, will race to this boat and drop it into the water and escape, e actually leaving their wives behind um, and, and eventually they will make their way to St. They survive. They make their way to St. Louis where they are placed under arrest and brought back to uh, Memphis for a trial. But we don't know what happened further than that. We do know they were arrested. We knew the, do know they were put on trial. Don't know their, their final fate. Um, here, if you look at the 
the paddle wheel on the side where this this other circle is, you can see some uh, streaks going down and you see some lines or, or cracks in the paddle wheel housing. That's where these guys are going to the bathroom. That streaking down the side is human waste. These guys were using buckets that normally would have been filled with sand and used as fire buckets. They were using buckets to go to the bathroom in because there was no way they could get to the only two bathrooms on a steamboat. One behind the paddle wheel on the second deck on one side and one behind the paddle wheel on the other side. These guys were so crowded, they had nowhere to go. So they would go into the buckets. When the buckets were filled, they would just pour it over the side. So that's what that streaking is. Uh, and if you look at this entire photograph, there is nobody in this section right here. And that is because there's as crowded as it is, uh, this area is left uh, vacant because the paying civilian passengers had to have some place where they could go and sit on a chair and watch the scenery go by without being crowded by the soldiers or harassed by the soldiers. So again, this was an amazing photograph that was taken. We do believe that this is actually uh, uh, James Cass Mason, the captain in the uh, door of the pilot house. There, There's uh, what Mason looked like and it almost looks like him standing there in the, in the window. Also in that area where uh, I said it was for paying civilians, we do believe that this right here, if you sort of squint and use your imagination, this was a, a woman passenger. She was identified um, as Mrs. Smith, Miss Smith. She had not been married yet. And uh, one of the men said that she had a beautiful voice because the Sultana had a piano on board and they said they remember her singing. Now the Sultana will leave uh, uh, Helena, Arkansas and go up river to Memphis. They arrives at about seven o'clock. At Memphis, they will unload that 300,000 pounds of, of sugar from the hold. With all these guys on the upper decks, this now makes this Sultana very, very top heavy. It had been top heavy before. It had rocked back and forth a few times, but now it was really bad. Uh, around midnight, the Sultana will go up river and take on some coal. And then it starts following on this map. If you see where the river is going, to, that little S there, there's actually some dotted lines. And that is the course that the steamboats would take. The, the Sultana will get all the way up to the very top near where it says Rodman's Point. And the Sultana will have to go from one side of the river, the, the uh, eastern side to the western side. As it crossed the river, it was getting hit in the side with that very strong current. And if the Sultana had a tendency to lean a little bit before, think what it's going to do now without that ballast in the, in the hole, without the sugar in there. The problem is the four boilers on the Sultana are interconnected. So when the boat tilts, what happens is the water in the upper boilers will all flow down into the lower boilers. There's still a uh, fire underneath that upper boiler. The, the boiler will become red hot. When the boat crosses the river, comes back to an even keel, the water from those lower boilers will rush back to that first boiler, hit that, hit that super hot metal, and that causes an increase in the um, uh, pressure inside the boilers. You'll see here, you'll see how the, uh, if, the, if the boat tilts just a little bit on the uh, left-hand side, those tubes are not covered with water. They will turn red hot. When you come back to an even keel, it increases, you know, you, the, the water will hit those, that hot uh, tubes, create extra pressure. If the boilers can't hold it, boom, you have an explosion. Two o'clock in the morning, one of the boilers will explode, followed by two more. In an instant, the Sultana is crippled. The, the explosion comes from the back of the boiler, which shows, uh, I don't know if people have heard that perhaps the Sultana was sabotaged by a Confederate coal torpedo. Well, that's nonsense because a coal torpedo would have been up front where the figure in this uh, uh, drawing is standing. Uh, you throw your coal into the grating where he is at. The explosion comes from the back and goes upward. It did not come from below and go outward. Um, so this should dispel the fact that the Sultana was sabotaged. The explosion tears up uh, at about a 45 degree angle and rips off the pilot house. This was a problem. 
because steamboat pilots were told that if there's ever an explosion, if there's ever a fire on board, you just head for the nearest shore, you jam the boat against the bank, let everybody run off and let the boat burn, but at least everybody's safe. But when the pilot house is blown off of the Sultana, you now have uh, nobody to steer it. The two smokestacks will actually topple. One falls backwards into uh, the area where the pilot house would have been, where the hole is. The second one falls forward, hits the very crowded front deck uh, where all these guys have been sleeping. It's two o'clock in the morning. They were sound asleep. The smokestack hits right smack in the middle and crushes the upper deck down into the second deck where more men were, were sleeping. So you have the two decks come together. People were crushed. People were trapped. However, because the, the main stairwell opening comes up into the second deck and, and it, you had some sturdy stairwell, uh, um, st um, uh, banisters there, the upper deck does not crush those guys because they're sleeping around the banisters. They're able to crawl on their hands and knees and slide down the stairs. So some of them were saved. But you have this mad panic of people to get off the boat. Um, the Sultana did not burst into flames immediately. What happens is uh, when the boilers are exploded, they expose the furnaces. When all this, the, the smokestacks crush down, they crush the decks down into the wood and stuff will slide sort of like a funnel down into the exposed boilers or furnaces. And that's where the, the uh, fire starts. Some of the men said, had we been able to grab the fire buckets, we could have put out the fire and there would have been no deaths from from burning, there would have been a death from the explosion. However, none of the fire buckets were where they should be because the men had been using them as toilets. So the Sultana will burst into flames eventually. And uh, what it what is discovered is that the flames are actually going towards the back of the boat. The wind and such is pushing them towards the back. There's an initial mad rush to get off. Nobody knows what's going on. Two o'clock in the morning, you've just been rudely awakened. You rush to get off the boat, but then the guys on the bow say, wait a minute, we're safe. The, the wind is blowing the, the flames backwards. So the guys that have jumped into the water, well, they're struggling, but the guys that have stayed on the bow say, why don't we just wait and see what happens? So the flames will head backwards. And now you have a mass exodus from uh, the upper decks. And people from the lower deck are jumping into the water and people from the second deck are jumping in and people from the top, the hurricane deck are jumping on top of everybody else. So you have people jumping on top of people and grabbing onto each other. And if you thought that maybe you had put on some weight at the parole camp, once you jump into the freezing cold water in April, 1865, the, the, the uh, cold ice water runoff from the North that sapped your strength very, very quickly. One of the people that will, will uh, climb overboard uh, from the back uh, was the Annis family. Uh, Harvey Annis had been a soldier that had gotten sick and his wife and uh, little eight-year-old Isabella had come down from Oshkosh, Wisconsin to nurse him and then to bring him back to Wisconsin. So he will be discharged from the military. So he's in the uh, paying passenger in one of the cabins. When the boat uh, explodes, he will take and uh, put a life preserver a belt, I should say, around himself and a life belt around Anne. Uh, Isabel is too small, so he puts Isabel on his shoulder and they climb to the back of the boat. Uh, and I'm going to go back one slide. They will go to the back of the boat and where you see uh, the very end of the boat on like this, we'll say the, the second or third deck, there's some yellow windows there. They climb out that on a rope and as they're coming down, uh, Harvey and Isabel, with Isabel on his back, will make it all the way to the water, but Anne is knocked back into the boat by somebody jumping from above. She eventually gets into the water. She finds out that her life preserver, her life belt is on crooked now because a guy hit her. She swims over to the rudder and she's hanging on to the rudder trying to correct her life belt when her, her husband and daughter disappear. Uh, later on, somebody notices that there was a fella and a daughter, a, a, a young lady in a pink nightgown, which is what Isabel was wearing, uh, was on a door, uh, but they got into an eddy and eventually she gets swept off. Harvey tries to get her, but in his weakened condition, both of them will drown. Ann Annis is the only survivor of the Annis family. She's only one of two women passengers that will survive the Sultana out of about uh, 30 or 40 women passengers. 
Now, uh, the Bostona too was coming down river and they saw uh, a light in front of them and they said, oh, it must be a farmhouse on fire. As they got closer, they saw that, no, uh, it looks like a steamboat because it's actually moving. And as they looked at it, you know, with binoculars, they could see that things were jumping off and they thought, oh, cattle must be jumping off into the water. As they got closer, they saw that it was human beings. And the Bostona will try to go to the rescue and uh, rip off shutters and doors and uh, deck planking and such and throw it into the river and try to save these guys. They threw their lines in and pulled up, up as many men as they could. They actually save about 150 people. And then the captain, a man named John Watson will say, guys, we have to leave here and rush down to, to uh, Memphis and tell the people in Memphis what has happened. I can't save everybody, but if we can get the other boats to come to the rescue, it'll sure help. So he will break off his rescue attempts and go down river. But he didn't have to worry about it because Memphis, one of the guys had already floated down river and had warned Memphis he'd been rescued and had said, guys, the Sultana blew up. So the steamboats at Memphis are trying to build up pressure in their boilers. And in the meantime, they're sending out their little rowboats and their little sounding yawls to try to rescue as many people as possible. The Salt after the Bostona left, what happens is the one side wheel paddle, uh, paddle wheel housing will fall into the river, but it doesn't break all the way off. It burns through, it falls over, and then it acts like a giant outrigger canoe. The current hits that and starts to turn the Sultana. So now all those guys that had about 400 people that had waited on the bow thinking it was safe because all the flames are being blown to the back. When this Sultana suddenly turns all the way around and then the second paddle wheel housing will fall off and basically steady it. But the Sultana has now turned down river and the, and the wind is blowing the flames now towards them. So there's a second panic to get off the bow. But now there is no uh, pieces of wood that was grabbed by the first group. The first guys had grabbed anything floatable, barrels, uh, hay bales, pieces of wood. The second group, everything's gone. These are more than likely the guys that couldn't swim to begin with. That's why they waited. And now there's a second mad panic. One of the guys that will be in the water was 17 year old John H. Simpson. And he fought his way through some of these men. But as he floated down river, he wasn't so worried about uh, people trying to grab him. What he was worried about was that darn Sultana alligator. But he really didn't have to worry because another gentleman, William Luganbeal with the 135th Ohio Volunteer Infantry had also remembered the alligator. But more than that, he remembered the sturdy wooden crate that the alligator was in. So he, he found the bayonet he uh, may have had a bayonet for some reason that he had picked up in the parole camp. He broke open the closet door, stabbed the alligator three times with the bayonet, threw it onto the deck, took the sturdy wooden box, threw it into the water and jumped into it. And he floated down river to Memphis in his own little um, uh, rowboat. Now, people have questioned, did this really happen or is this you know, uh, just a story? Well, in our museum in Marion, Arkansas, across the river from Memphis, where we're, we now have a temporary museum and we're building a permanent museum, we have a curio box that was once owned by William Luganbeal. Uh, and on the top, it says, William Luganbeal got the drawing of an alligator and it says, saved by an alligator. In fact, he even had a little piece of ivory, ivory scrimshaw that was carved into uh, the shape of an alligator. And there you see it. And then we now also have a cane that was owned by William Luganbeal. And again, on it, it's got a little couple of little uh, silver inlays of alligators and it says saved by an alligator. So did he really uh, survive by, by taking it? It sure looks that way. Well, the Sultana will float all the way down river from where it exploded up there by Rodman's Point down to around Mound City. And it will actually uh, uh, lodge into some, some overflowed treetops. Um, the, the water is so flooded that uh, the only thing sticking above the, the water is the tops of trees and guys are, are floating into them and grabbing on. And when they put their feet down to see if the land is there, there is no land, they're in the top of a tree. The Sultana will float down river and lodge uh, against some of these treetops in an area called Patty's Hen and Chicken Islands. And they actually, it actually hits at the, at the head of Hen Island. Um, in the morning, when the sun comes up, 
guys are just littered up and down. By this time, this, the, uh, the uh, steamboats have gotten built up their pressure. They will uh, take and leave Memphis and go back and forth across the river, rescuing people off, the, off of trees, off the roofs of overflowed uh, uh, cattle barns and stuff like that. And it is just uh, people all over and bodies all over. Uh, the bodies and the people are brought to Memphis. The bodies are laid along the, the banks there. Uh, Memphis will actually run out of coffins. There are so many bodies uh, that are, are pulled, pulled ashore. Uh, the hacks, the wagons are brought down and people are taken to uh, five central hospitals as well as a soldier's home, which is sort of like a Civil War USO. Um, over 750 people are gonna be taken, rescued and taken to these hospitals. Out of this, this number, only like 25 of them will die of their, of their wounds, of their burns and their injuries. Um, so once you got to a hospital, your chances of survival was pretty good. Of course, you're not being rescued until seven or eight o'clock in the morning. And so you've had from two o'clock in the morning, time of the explosion till eight o'clock to sort of drift through this cold water and with, suffer from your burns. And so if you could survive till eight o'clock, your chances of survival was pretty good. Um, and here uh, again, the, you know, the bodies were collected. So, uh, the Memphis will run out of caskets. Uh, blankets are used to cover. And as men are rescued, they will look a lot, look upon all these bodies looking for brothers, fathers, uh, friends that they knew in their regiment. Uh, a lot of bodies are found. Very, very few are identified because a lot of the guys had stripped off their clothes, jump into the water so that nobody would grab onto their coats and their pants and stuff and drag them under. Of course, they had no dog tags like we have nowadays. So these are now unidentified individuals. Um, some, of the, some of the people will actually float past Memphis and, get, and go down all the way towards Fort Pickering, which was guarding the Southern approaches uh, to uh, Memphis. Uh, in the early morning hours, as the sun is just coming up and you got a fog on the river, uh, the guards at Fort Pickering will hear these boats out on the river, don't know that these are little rowboats trying to pick up uh, survivors. And they were told, if you see any little boats out on the river, it might be Confederate guerrillas, shoot at them. So some of these guards will shoot at these guys that are trying to, boats that are trying to rescue Sultana survivors. Eventually, one of the guys in the boats will go over to Fort Pickering and say, hey, stop shooting at us. There was a disaster. And the guards at Fort Pickering, uh, it was a, uh, a, a unit of U.S. colored troops, will, will go out of their way to help rescue people, build fires, bring down coffee, uh, put out medicines, and take the, some of the sick guys to the Fort Pickering uh, Hospital. Um, William Fiddler, the major in charge of the uh, the prisoners on board, the, the top ranking officer, he will die in the disaster. Um, he jumps into the water to try to help save a, a, a woman and he is surrounded and pulled under by others. And so he does, his body is never found. James Cass Mason, he also survived the initial explosion. He is seen on different parts of the decks, uh, ripping off shutters and pieces of wood and throwing them uh, into the water, but he is never seen to leave the Sultana and his body is never recovered also. Um, what is the toll on the Sultana? Out of the 2,136 people that were on board, 1,169 died. You will probably hear numbers of 1,500, 1,700, 1,800. That's all wrong. Our latest research, in 2015, I retired and decided to do strong, strong research to find out how many men were actually on the Sultana and how many died because those numbers kept going up, 1,500, 1,700, 1,900. There's even a website that says 2,000. Well, I have been able to verify 1,169 as well as over 950 survivors because I have found headstones and I have found pension records. And if you died in, uh, in 1890, then you sure didn't die in the Sultana. Um, so we know that over 950 people survived and there was 1,169 that died. Um, the Sultana did get pretty good um, uh, advertisement. Some people have said, well, it's been really you know, lost from history. It really wasn't. Uh, Cincinnati, St. Louis, uh, some of the uh, uh, bigger river towns really spent months and months uh, looking into the disaster. 
However, some of the bigger newspapers like in New York and in Philadelphia and Boston, they did sort of push it aside after uh, uh, a couple of weeks because there was so much more going on. They were still hunting for John Wilkes, or uh, sorry, they were hunting for Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. John Wilkes Booth will be shot on April 26th, the day uh, that the Sultana stopped at Helena. So the, of course, the first stories were uh, on April 27th, the day the Sultana explodes. Lincoln's body was being, being brought across the Northern uh, states uh, till its final burying place in Springfield, Illinois. So there was a lot going on and it wasn't that the Sultana was overlooked as much as it was sort of pushed to the back pages because of all these other significant events. Now, only one man was ever brought to trial for the Sultana and it was not Captain Reuben Hatch. It was Frederick Speed, Captain Frederick Speed, who had been out at the parole camp and he was putting the guys on the train and sending them into Vicksburg. He never put a single person on the boat, but he is the guy that they go after. Uh, Hatch, shortly after the disaster, will uh, quit the service. He retires from the service and goes back to Illinois. Um, the, at the uh, uh, Frederick Speed court-martial trial, Hatch is subpoenaed three times. He ignores all three subpoenas. He's also, they put out a writ of attachment. A writ of attachment is for a U.S. Marshal to go to Hatch's home and literally attach himself to Hatch and drag his butt back to Vicksburg. Uh, Hatch knows this is coming and he's in hiding. So the marshal cannot find him. Hatch knew that he was a guilty person, but he will never spend one day in prison uh, or, or a court martial uh, in connection with the Sultana disaster. Frederick Speed is actually found guilty of overcrowding the Sultana. But when Judge Advocate Holt looks at it, he says, no, Speed had nothing to do with it. And, uh, and he is, the, the conviction is overturned. Uh, so nobody is held responsible for the Sultana. If you were to take and rank the Sultana as far as uh, deaths of Union soldiers in battle, it would rank number 12. Uh, uh, battles such as Gettysburg, Cold Harbor, Shiloh, uh, Second Manassas, they had of course many, many more deaths than on the Sultana, but those were also Gettysburg was a three-day affair. The wilderness was a three-day affair. Um, Chickamauga, two days. The Sultana, all these deaths occur within about six hours. So uh, this was terrible. 1,047 soldiers will die uh, on the Sultana as, you know, uh, not including the deaths of the um, civilian passengers and the crew. Uh, overall, 1,169 people died, but only 1,047 soldiers. It ranks higher than uh, Battle of Chattanooga, uh, the assault on Vicksburg on May 22nd, Franklin, Tennessee uh, uh, battle, Pea Ridge. So the Sultana was uh, was really uh, a horrendous loss. Uh, in in uh, uh, 1912, you will have the loss of the Titanic. The Titanic carried about the same amount of people as the Sultana had. The, the Titanic had 2,223 people, the Sultana 2,136. Yet look at the difference in the size of the two vessels. If you think that, that, that the people in the Sultana were not crowded, just look at this right here. And of course, the, the Titanic will have more people die than on the Titan, than the, the Sultana. Uh, but again, the, the Sultana will rank as the deadliest maritime disaster in US history because the Titanic was a British vessel. Um, this is just showing you, you know, the, the different sizes when you look at the, at the size of the two boats. In comparison, let's look at the USS Arizona on December 7th, 1941, when it's attacked by the Japanese, had 1,177 sailors die on board it, sailors and Marines. Um, everybody remembers the Arizona, everybody remembers uh, Pearl Harbor. But how many people remember the Sultana, which had 1,047 soldiers, you know, just one, 130 people less? Nobody remembers the Sultana. Uh, yet, as I said, everybody remembers the Arizona and Pearl Harbor. Um, we do have a Sultana Disaster Museum that we are uh, uh, trying to get built in Marion, Arkansas, which is across the river from Memphis. And this is close to um, where, where the, the remains of the Sultana are now buried under an Arkansas bean field. What happened was the Sultana, of course, sank into the river. 
uh, over the years, it was covered with silt, silt, silt. And then when the Mississippi changed course, it now is about two miles from the actual river under an Arkansas soybean field. We have an interim museum, which you're seeing the picture of there. We have a, a 14 foot model that I built of the Sultana on display. We have a number of artifacts from survivors, uh, even from some pictures and such from some of the guys that died on board. We are trying to raise $7 million to build a permanent uh, a building. We have the building, a 1938 uh, gymnasium slash auditorium in uh, downtown Marion, Arkansas, across the river from Memphis. And we are, uh, again, trying to raise the funds and open this in the, in the uh, spring of 2023. And these are some of the other books that I have written. Uh, I've written a total of five different books, one on the Civil War, the disaster on the Mississippi. The other four are World War II related books. The one Fortress Against the Sun is really out of print, although you may be able to find it on eBay or such. But the other ones, Rolling Thunder Against the Rising Sun, Blossoming Silk Against the Rising Sun, and Second Pearl Harbor, um, all dealing with uh, the World War II in the Pacific, are available through Amazon.com if anybody is interested. You just go to Amazon, type in Gene Salaker, and all these books will pop up.